فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ Then whoever was compelled in starvation. اُضْطُرَّ What does it mean by اُضْطُرَّ? اُضْطُرَّ is when a person is forced, when he is compelled to do something that he dislikes, to do something that he finds harmful. Why is he forced to do it? Because of some external force. That he doesn't have any choice. He doesn't know what else to do. This is the only option he has. And he hates doing it. He hates doing it. Why? Because he knows it is harmful for him. He knows it's not good for him. So whoever is compelled, compelled to do what? Compelled to eat of the haram. And when is he compelled? Fi مَخْمَصَةٍ In extreme starvation. What type of hunger is مَخْمَصَ? In particular, it is when a person's stomach goes in. Literally it goes in. Basically he hasn't eaten anything for days. He's so hungry, he's so hungry that literally his stomach goes in. So basically this is a person who is starving. This is a person who is starving. So, فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ Not that I couldn't have my lunch, I couldn't have my dinner, and now I'm hungry. No. This is extreme starvation. Literally, you will see that in some countries where there is famine, or where there has been famine, you will see the images of children, of even adults, that their rib cage is sticking out, it's elevated, and on the other hand, the stomach is literally inside. This is what مَخْمَصَةٍ is. So, فَمَنْ اضْطُرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ And he eats of the haram غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِإِسْمٍ He is not inclining to sin. Meaning he is not inclining purposely to sin. He is not committing an act of disobedience. He doesn't desire to eat it. But he is eating it. Why? Because he is forced out of necessity. And earlier we read غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ That indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful to this person when he eats a little bit in order to save his life. So what do we learn from this ayah? First of all, we learn from this ayah about the beauty of our deen. About the ease that is in our deen. If you notice in the previous ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about what is halal for you. أُحِلَّتْ لَكُمْ بَهِيمَةُ الْأَنْعَامِ all of the bahimatul an'am are halal for you. Everything is halal for you. And the only thing that is haram for you is this, this, this. So basically we see that the easy command is mentioned first and then the difficult command is mentioned. On one side, the restrictions are mentioned and on the other side, the allowances are given. This is the ease that is in our deen. This is the beauty of our deen. That yes, the rules are very clear. But easy command is mentioned first, then the more challenging command is mentioned. You're told, do eat whatever you want to, however, just avoid this. Just like Adam a.s., what was he told? That eat whatever you want, freely, happily, to your full, but just don't eat of this one tree. That's it. And this is our test, because life is a test. This is not Jannah. Secondly, we learn from this ayah about the prohibition of eating the different types of creatures that have been mentioned in the ayah. That first of all, the maita, whether it is of bahimatul an'am or otherwise. Secondly, dam, blood. Any blood that is masfuh, that is flowing, that is unlawful. Other than that, if there is blood that comes out when you're cooking or when you're eating, that is okay. Thirdly, lahmul khinzir, meaning all of it, dead or alive, whether as the main ingredient or a sub-ingredient. Lahmul khinzir is haram, whether as a main ingredient or a sub-ingredient. And you know what that means, sub-ingredient. Fourthly, ma uhilla li ghayrillah. And this shows to us the ta'zim of shirk, the enormity of shirk. That even such food is unlawful to eat in which there is shirk involved. Imagine that if there is food that you acquire through shirk, that food is also unlawful. What does that show? The enormity of shirk. That it's such a big deal. I 
mean, it affects food as well? It affects what you eat as well? What does it show? That shirk is zulmun alim. Then, munkhaniqa, mawquda, mutaraddiya, natiha, all of these animals are also forbidden to eat. Again, whether from the behematul an'am or birds. وَمَا أَكَلَ السَّبْعُ And that which the animal has hunted for himself. مَا ذُبِحَ عَلَى النُّصُبْ Meaning that which is a part of mushrik ritual. And as well as istiqsam bil azlam, Meat acquired through gambling. Such meat is also forbidden. So basically we see that in order for meat to be halal, it must meet the following two requirements. If you look at all of these different categories that have been mentioned in this ayah, we can summarize this that in order for meat to be halal, it has to meet two requirements. First of all, it has to be of an animal that is halal fi nafsihi, that is halal in itself. You can't take a lion and slaughter it and say bismillah. No. Similarly, a person cannot take a pig and do the same. No. The animal itself has to be halal. And which ones are they? Bahimatul anam. The second requirement is, the second condition is, that the method of acquiring that meat should also be halal. The method of acquiring the meat of the animal should also be halal. What does that mean? That first of all, it has to be slaughtered properly. If it's dead already, you can't eat it. However it died, you can't eat it. It has to be slaughtered properly. Similarly, the way you earn it, the way you acquire it, meaning if you gain it through gambling, it's not lawful for you. Similarly, if it was slaughtered properly but it was dedicated to someone else, it hasn't been acquired through the right way. The correct way of acquiring meat is that the earning should be halal and the method of slaughtering the animal should also be halal. So for any meat to be permissible, it has to meet these two requirements. We also learn from this ayah about the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in making haram what He made haram. What's the wisdom? If a person eats meat that is decaying, like for example an animal that died like a week ago and you find it and you start eating of it, is it going to affect you? Is it going to be harmful for you? Of course it's going to be harmful for you. So everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram for us, there is wisdom behind it. There is wisdom behind it. There is always some reason behind it. We also learn from this ayah about the fact that the meat that is permissible for consumption is that which must meet specific requirements. I mentioned to you earlier that first of all, the animal should be halal fi nafsihi and secondly, the meat should be halal fi kasabihi. So basically, the animal that is slaughtered must be slaughtered properly. What is the proper way of slaughtering the animal? What is the proper way of slaughtering the animal? First of all, the person who is slaughtering, the person who is slaughtering the animal, he must be a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian. If it's a mushrik, an atheist, or you don't know who they are, okay, you don't know who they are, then in that case, you're not going to eat that meat. Why? Because a person who is slaughtering has to be either a Muslim or Jew or Christian. What's the evidence that it has to be a Jew or Christian? Inshallah we will read that in the following ayat. Secondly, Bismillah must be pronounced. Meaning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be pronounced. Because we read, وَمَا أُهِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ What does that mean? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name must be mentioned. It has to be dedicated to Allah. And thirdly, the animal should be killed how? By cutting the jugular vein so that the blood is drained from the body. Some have specified one particular vein. Others have specified not just the vein but the windpipe as well, as well as the esophagus. However, as long as the main vein is cut through which the blood drains out, that is permissible. And again, this applies to both animals as well as birds. Now, 
there's always a question of machine slaughter. Because there's something so common. So what's the deal with that? Most of the time before the animal is machine slaughtered, what's the process? That it has to be electrocuted before. It has to be shocked before. So a chicken, a cow, a goat, it has to be shocked before. Otherwise you cannot machine slaughter it. Otherwise it would be so difficult to control those animals. So you have to make them unconscious before slaughtering them. Because you're slaughtering at a mass level. You're slaughtering like a hundred chickens at a time. So you can't possibly have them all conscious at that time. So the animals when they're electrocuted, most of the time they don't die right away. Most of the time. But some animals, it is said about 5% or 10%, maybe less than that, sometimes they do die. So, are those animals considered as mawqudah? Because mawqudah is what? That which has been struck by a violent blow. So, okay, if it was an electric shock, does it mean that the animal is dead and now you can't eat it? Now you can't slaughter it? Remember that we learned that even from the mawqudah, illa ma dhakaytu. It takes seconds Seconds between shocking the animal and slaughtering the animal. The animal does not immediately become cold. It's still warm. And when it is slaughtered, even if it has died before, even if the heart has stopped working, still what happens? The blood flows out. So, this falls under illa ma dhakaytum. The mawqudha illa ma dhakaytum. Because it takes seconds within which the animal, if it was shocked, even if it died, even if it died, which is a very rare chance, but even if it does, what's going to happen? You're slaughtering it immediately. So it falls under illa ma because before it becomes cold, before the blood clots inside, you manage to slaughter the animal and the blood has drained out. One more thing, that the animals that are slaughtered together by one act, because we learned earlier that Bismillah has to be pronounced. Now, when you're machine slaughtering, you have like, let's say, a hundred chickens on one panel, and one knife is going to come in, is going to slaughter them. So, you're saying Bismillah once only. For all of those animals. Does it mean that you have to say Bismillah for each and every single chicken? You see, when it comes to one act of slaughter, so for example, you have two goats side by side, Or you have two chickens side by side. You take one knife, you say Bismillah, and with one act you slaughter both of them. One act. Okay? But you're slaughtering two or more. But because you said Bismillah and the act was the same, this is why that Bismillah applies to not just the first animal, but all of the animals. You understand? Because the act is the same. Now, what about saying one bismillah and then slaughtering 50 animals one by one. Like you say bismillah and you slaughter one animal, then you slaughter the other animal, but when you slaughter the second animal, you didn't say bismillah. What about that? That is also permissible. Why? Because when you say bismillah, you don't just intend to say bismillah for the first animal. You're intending to say that bismillah for all of the animals in the row. Understand? Just like when you're eating food, you say bismillah on the first morsel. Do you say bismillah on everything that you put in your mouth? When you're doing wudu, you say bismillah at the beginning. Do you say bismillah when you're rinsing your mouth and you're washing your face each and every step? You don't. Because that bismillah is intended for the entire wudu. Similarly, when the butcher is standing over there and he's slaughtering a thousand cows maybe, is it possible for him to say Bismillah for each and every cow? If his intention is that this Bismillah applies to all of these animals, then it is permissible. Because it's the intention as well. And he didn't just mean that Bismillah for the first animal, but he means it for all of the animals. Because it's not possible that so many animals a person is slaughtering and one person's job is to only say Bismillah, 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 Bismillah. bismillah. I mean, how can he say that? When the speed is so fast and it's not possible to slaughter all animals by hand today, it's not necessary to slaughter animals by hand because hunting is permissible. And when you hunt an animal, what are you sending? Your hand? 
it's either your dagger or your arrow or your bullet or your hunting animal or something like that so what does that show that using the hand to slaughter is also not something that is mandatory because there is no explicit evidence that mentions that so you understand about slaughtering business it took me so long to figure this out i called my mother last night at about 12:30 at night and like can you please explain this to me and tell me if what i understood was correct because there are so many opinions out there but you have to see what's the evidence behind each and every one of them and the most important is that is there any evidence from the quran and sunnah if there is evidence from the quran and sunnah then accept it and if there isn't then don't accept it what i mentioned to you right now there's clearly evidence behind it in the first case as i mentioned to you illa ma dhakaytum and secondly that bismillah the niyyah behind it applies to not just the first animal but all of the animals just like when you're doing wudu just like when you're eating food because it's not humanly possible to repeat bismillah every single time we also learn from this ayah that eating of haram food is a fisk it's a sinful act and remember that the matter of halal and haram is very mm-hmm. serious we cannot take this lightly because ذَلِكُمْ فِسْقُ It is a sin. This is not something very light. This is something very serious. And right at the beginning of the surah we learned, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْفُوا بِالْعُقُودِ This is an aqt, eating of the halal, avoiding the haram. This is a promise that you've made with Allah. Fulfill it. We also learned from this ayah about the prohibition of such fear of the disbelievers that leads to compromise in their religion. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنِي So one should not have such fear of the disbelievers that leads him to compromising his religion. Don't fear them. And sometimes, you know, we fear them and we say, that how can we tell them to slaughter the animals our way? It's their country, it's their butcher houses, we can't tell them. No, you can. Why should you fear them? When they allow so many cultures, so many people, why just because you're afraid you're not going to request, you're not going to ask? Go ahead, ask, and you will be able to get what you want. We also learn from this ayah about the fact that the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us is complete. And nothing of the deen has been left out that is important for us to know. Because Allah has said, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ So nothing that is important for us to know has been left out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also learned from this ayah about the great blessing of Allah in completing and perfecting the deen. Because immediately after saying, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي That the fact that the religion is complete, it's a huge blessing. It's a huge favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we learned that once a Jewish man, he came to Umar ibn al-Khattab عنه, and he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, there is a verse in your book which is read by all of you. And had it been revealed to us, we would have taken that day on which it was revealed as a day of celebration. Had we been given that verse, that your religion is complete, the day that that verse was given to us, we would have made it a day of celebration. We would celebrate we would make it an Eid, a festival. Why? Because we would be so happy to know that the religion that Allah has given us is complete. So what does this show? That the fact that the religion is complete is a huge blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that Allah has taught us about everything that we need to know is a huge blessing. Just imagine if the matter of halal and haram was left unclear if it was left unexplained, how difficult life would become. But when you read the ayat of the Qur'an, when you read the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the matter of halal and haram is quite clear. We also learn from this ayah about the obligation of adhering to the deen, respecting the deen, and taking the deen seriously. Where do we learn that from? That it's a blessing of Allah. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ Allah has approved Islam as the religion for us. So if Allah has approved this for us, should we not adhere to it? Should we not respect it? 
Should we not take it seriously? Should we mock at it? No. If this is a huge blessing of Allah, what does it mean? We have to show shukr. And what is shukr? What is gratitude? That you take the blessing of Allah seriously. You acknowledge the fact that it has come from Allah. You do what is required of you. And you respect it. You take it seriously. We also learn that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen this deen for us, if Allah has chosen Islam for us, then we should also choose Islam for ourselves. If Allah has selected, if He has chosen Islam for us, what should we choose for ourselves? Islam. You know, sometimes people say, especially our young Muslims who are learning, and they say that, what if there is another religion that is better? I want to learn for myself. I want to decide on my own. What's the answer? Allah has chosen Islam for you. Allah has selected, He has chosen Islam for you. Because if you think of it, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Jews and the Christians, they existed. They exist till now. The Jews, their laws were there. The Christians, their laws were there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not approve those laws for us. He approved His laws for us. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ So we should be grateful, we should not feel shy, nor should we be scared, and we should make sure that we adhere to our deen properly. We also learn from this ayah that a person who opposes the deen, goes against the teachings of the deen, or he alters the deen, changes the deen, or invents something new in the deen, then is that acceptable for him? No. What's the evidence? وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ that what Allah approves of is Islam. Which Islam? The religion that He has given us. So if a person tries to add something in the deen, is it approved of? No. If a person alters that which is in the deen, is it approved? No. Because a deen that is approved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a deen that He gave us. So if any person invents an action, it is rejected. It is not approved. It is not acceptable. We also learn from this ayah about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where He has allowed the consumption of that which is haram even in the state of starvation, in the state of extreme hunger. We learn that the companions of the Prophet sallallahu they asked him that, O Messenger of Allah, we live in a land where famine often strikes us. Therefore, when are we allowed to eat the meat of dead animals? Meaning, we suffer from famine a lot, but how do we know that now is a time that we are allowed to eat the meat of dead animals? The Prophet ﷺ said, when you neither find food for lunch and dinner. So when you don't have food for lunch or dinner, the whole day, you have nothing to eat. The whole day, you found nothing to eat. Nor have you any produce to eat. Meaning you have no vegetables, you have no fruit, you have no grains, you have no cereal. Then you will eat the flesh of the dead animal. So basically, when a person has gone hungry without eating anything at all, anything at all, for an entire day, nothing at all. And now obviously he's going to be starving the next day. If a person does not eat anything for a whole 24 hours, he's going to be starving. And if a person does not eat anything for a certain number of hours, then he can die. So, in that stage, a person may eat of that which is haram. We also learn from this ayah about the importance, rather the obligation of being extremely careful about avoiding haram. And trying one's best to avoid the haram. That you avoid it, avoid it, avoid it to the extent that you have reached makhmasa. This is how much you're avoiding the haram. You have reached that level. So what does it show to us? About the obligation of avoiding haram as much as a person can. To the best of his ability. He should try his best to stay away from it. Recitation. حرمت 
إِلَّا مَا ذَكَّيْتُمْ